This is a 2D version of my 3D video about phosphoglucoisomerase. If you have a VR headset, I highly recommend my 3D video. There's a link in the video description. But if you're ready, let's experience this enzyme in 2D. You may see phosphoglucoisomerase called a few names, one of which is glucose 6-phosphate isomerase. But both of these names contain the same information. In glycolysis, the molecule that acts as the substrate is glucose 6-phosphate, or G6P, and it undergoes an isomerization reaction, forming fructose 6-phosphate, which we'll call F6P. Isomerization changes the arrangement of the covalent bonds in a molecule, but the chemical formula of the isomers is the same. Delta G for the isomerization reaction of G6P to F6P is negative 2.92, and at cellular pH, it's calculated to be a positive 1.67. What this means is that the isomerization reaction is pretty close to equilibrium. Delta G and delta G naught prime are both hovering right around zero. Therefore, the reaction performed by this enzyme is reversible. The relative concentrations of G6P and F6P in the cytoplasm of the cell will determine whether the enzyme will catalyze the forward or reverse reaction. So this enzyme is important in both the glycolysis pathway, which breaks down glucose to produce energy, and the gluconeogenesis pathway, which makes glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. In this video, I'll refer to phosphoglucoisomerase as PGI. The active form of the PGI enzyme is a dimer, which means two chains of the protein come together to form the active enzyme. Because two distinct polypeptide chains come together, this enzyme has quaternary structure, which not every protein has. Let's color one chain white and one chain magenta so we can see each clearly in this cartoon representation or rendering of the enzyme. This dimer has a lot of symmetry, I want you to focus on these beta sheets right here, on the half of the dimer that we've colored white. Now I'm going to turn the protein 180 degrees. Notice this similar section of beta sheet on the other side, which is composed mostly of the magenta chain. Let's change our representation to space filling, where each atom of every amino acid in the protein is represented by a sphere to show its surface. I love this rendering because it gives a clear view of how the dimer is intertwined. It's like one chain of the enzyme is giving the other a hug. Now let's switch to the surface rendering of the protein, keeping our coloring the same. Each half of the enzyme contains a fully functional active site. In this structure, the enzyme is bound to an inhibitor, shown in green sticks. The inhibitor is bound to both active sites. And if we zoom in a little bit more, we can see, although this active site is mostly made up of the side of the dimer we colored white, some of the magenta half of the dimer is part of the active site too. In fact, some of the amino acid residues from the magenta side participate in the chemical reaction on the white side. So dimerization is critical to enzyme activity. You may be wondering how the dimer is actually held together in the body. The interactions are the same weak interactions that hold substrates and inhibitors in active sites, like we saw in my hexokinase video. Here we have a hydrophobic interaction. This phenylalanine is interacting with both valine and leucine residues, and these distances of about 4 angstroms measured from each atom's nucleus, are fairly representative of hydrophobic interactions involving atoms of this size. Perhaps a better way to view the interaction is to change to a space-filling rendering. Notice how close the surfaces of the amino acids are? Here they actually appear to touch. These hydrophobic side chains cluster together in interactions that exclude water from that area of the enzyme. Moving over, here we have a hydrogen bond. 
the implied hydrogen atom on this OH group of the threonine side chain is hydrogen bonding to the carbonyl oxygen of this glutamine residue. Hydrogen bonding is stronger than hydrophobic interactions. Notice the distance between the nuclei is shorter, this one being 2.8 angstroms. Finally, let's look at a potential ionic interaction. Aspartate is negatively charged at biological pH, and lysine side chains typically gain a proton in the body, becoming positively charged. Before we examine the active site of PGI in detail, we need to look at the reaction mechanism. This isomerization reaction actually looks a little extreme. How on earth are we going from a six-membered ring to a five-membered ring? Well, the reaction doesn't actually occur on the closed form of the sugar. First, the enzyme opens the ring. A proton is removed from the OH group on the anomeric carbon using a basic enzyme residue. The opening is facilitated by a protonated amino acid within the active site that donates a proton to this oxygen atom as the ring opens. Since the reaction occurs on the open chain, let's compare those of glucose and fructose. Now, instead of looking like a drastic rearrangement of the carbon skeleton, we can see the carbonyl group has simply moved one carbon atom over. The isomerization step begins when the enzyme removes a hydrogen atom from the carbon next to the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde. This forms an enol, a very common intermediate in biochemical reactions. This intermediate is actually called an enediol because there's an alkene here and two alcohol groups, enediol. To complete the reaction, a basic enzyme residue deprotonates this alcohol, and the electrons left behind form a carbonyl, this time a ketone, and the alkene gets protonated by the enzyme on the other side. The sugar ring can again close before the product is released from the active site. There are several crystal structures of rabbit PGI that give us some insights into how the active site residues catalyze the chemical reaction. The overall structure of the human and rabbit form of this enzyme is very similar, and the active site amino acids are totally conserved. In fact, even the active site of bacterial PGI contains identical amino acids to the human form. In this structure, the crystallographers captured PGI bound to the cyclic form of fructose 6-phosphate. In gluconeogenesis, this is the substrate of the reaction. So to begin, the ring must first be opened. Being a basic amino acid, histidine can become protonated. This histidine here is very close, within hydrogen bonding range of the ring oxygen. So this is likely the proton donor. The active site is a special environment. And depending on the amino acids and substrates nearby, Many basic and acidic amino acid residues can switch from being protonated and deprotonated to promote catalysis. The crystallographers that solved this crystal structure proposed that this lysine, instead of being formally positively charged, is hydrogen bonding to the hydrogen atom on this water molecule. This allows the water to behave more like hydroxide and be a better base since its other hydrogen atom is tied up with the lysine. The lysine nitrogen deprotonates this water, becoming formally positively charged, while the oxygen atom of the water deprotonates the hydrogen atom on this OH group of the sugar. This allows the ring to open up with the help of the histidine residue we looked at just a moment ago. Here is the open chain form of glucose 6-phosphate. Notice the aldehyde and the phosphate group here. There's a compound quite similar to this called 6-phosphogluconic acid or 6-PG. They both contain 6 carbon atoms, a phosphate group, and a carbonyl group. 
The big difference is that 6PG contains a carboxylic acid, which is negatively charged at biological pH instead of the aldehyde that glucose has. The carboxylic acid group prevents the compound from forming a ring and can give us more information about how the PGI enzyme may interact with a linear substrate. Fortunately, 6PG is an inhibitor of PGI, and there's a crystal structure available for us to look at. Examining the active site with 6PG bound, we can see this glutamate residue, which is the basic amino acid that deprotonates the open chain hexose sugar to form the enediol intermediate. Once it does that, the now protonated glutamic acid side chain can move over and donate the proton back to the other side of the alkene. You see, although crystal structures can give us great static images of the active site, proteins are dynamic, shifting and moving to interact with other molecules. Though we're focusing on catalysis here, we need to remember that all of the amino acid residues in the active site are critical in determining the substrates that the enzyme will bind. Here are some of the important hydrogen bonding interactions that form with the inhibitor 6PG. And these certainly contribute to binding the open chain sugar substrates as well. Notice that many of the hydrogen bonds involve water mediated contacts. Protein crystals are not dry, hard crystals. They must contain significant water to maintain a biologically relevant shape, since you and I and the rabbit this protein comes from are mostly made up of water. If you enjoyed diving into this enzyme with me, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and we'll look at more macromolecules together in the new year.